We have now come in this analysis about the key of David given to the Philadelphia era or rather to Philadelphia remnant. We have come now to brethren each particular tribe. We need to delve into each particular tribe of Israel to see how the prophecies of Genesis and Deuteronomy that were uttered by Jacob and that were uttered by Moses in the Pentateuch are being fulfilled today among this, the descendants of Jacob. Also, of course, there are other prophecies from other prophets that are being fulfilled today or had been fulfilled or were fulfilled in the past, but they're just, uh, the, they have far-reaching uh, far uh, effect. For example, the throne of David, as you know, it was prophesied it will take the root again and uh, will continue to flourish. It was prophesied in both uh, Ezekiel and Jeremiah and also in the book of Isaiah. So uh, we need to see how those prophecies are being fulfilled today. So we shall go into the first tribe. We'll just analyze the tribe of Judah. The tribe of Judah, of course, has a very rich history uh, and a great influence, after all, even in modern, modern day life. So therefore, no wonder we'll just have to make it into two parts, because I want you to kind of digest it you know, well and to be able to digest what is there about the tribe of Judah. Now, of course, you realize that Judah lives in the state of Israel today. Plenty of Judah lives in New York. But it might surprise to, come as a surprise to you that there are Judah and Judah influence in Northern Ireland and Scotland, believe it or not. Now we're going to see how and why. So this first part, I just want to bring to your attention that for the sake of time, I will be just giving you the references in the Bible, mostly rather than reading all the scriptures. But we do have notes and you'll be able to go over those notes in English language, of course, and to analyze them. Thankfully, I've made all those notes also in Serbian, and uh, I'll just uh, turn it in, into a form of a book in Serbian, the book, because the uh, truth about the identity of Israel and the role of Israel in God's salvation, plan of salvation, has never been preached in Serbian language, and uh, I've already delivered audio messages about Israel in the prophecy, in Serbian and I also plan again to have this publication of a book which would encompass all of those things that we've been analyzing in the last how many weeks now you know the basic lessons about the truth of Israel also each particular tribe how the uh, prophecies are being fulfilled today and then of course there would be the truth about the second exodus which you have learned and you remember from my sermon about the coming great second exodus anyway the tribe of Judah now Shem S-H-E-M, Shem, one of the sons of Noah, was the father of the Semites. And one of his descendants was Eber, A-B-E-R. He was Shem's great-grandson. And he is recorded in Genesis 11, chapter 11, verses 11 through 14. Now, Shem's great-grandson, Eber, was the father of the Hebrews. They've got the name from him, Eber Hebrews. And from one of the... One of these Hebrews came Jacob, who, as you remember, was later called Israel in Genesis chapter 32, verse 28, and from whom came the Israelites. Now, one of these Israelites, brethren, was named Judah, and Judah became the father of the Jews. Now, it is clear, therefore, that not all Semites, now this is very important, so mark this, brethren, not all Semites are Jews, and not all Hebrews are Jews. Not even all Israelites are Jews. But all Jews are Israelites and Hebrews and Semites. And most people just don't understand this clear distinction. Now, in fact, in the first place in all the Bible where the word Jew appears, we find that the Jews were fighting Israelites. Second Kings chapter 16, verse 6, the first time when the kingdom was already rendered into two parts. Northern Kingdom, the House of Judah, ten tribes, and uh, the House of Israel, that is ten tribes, and then Southern Kingdom with the capital in Jerusalem, the House of Judah. That's the first time in Second Kings sixteen six that we find the term Judah, and Judah was at war with Israel. Now, to identify where the Jews are today, we must first have a background. Now, Judah, it is written in Genesis thirty eight, verses one through five. Judah was first 
married to a impure, racially impure wife, Shua, and he had three sons who were racially, we might say, impure. They were not all Semites because Shua, the wife of Judah, was a Canaanite. It's written in Genesis 38, verses 1 through 5. Now, the three sons of Judah were named Er, Onan, and Shelach. Er and Onan died childless, and Shelach's descendants were workers in fine linen, potters, gardeners, and aides to the king. It is recorded about Shelach's descendants in First Chronicles chapter 4, verses 21 through 23. Interestingly enough, none were bankers, so the stereotyped Jew with olive skin, dark complexion, snub nose, and curly black hair came in part from this branch of Judah, this racially mixed branch of Judah. Now, before discussion, discussion of uh, Judah's other sons, it is important to understand the promise that God made to Abraham it's mentioned, as you know, in Genesis 22, 2, verse 18. God's promise to Abraham was that in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. And that you have the uh, reference points to that also in Genesis 13, verse 16, and Genesis 26, verses 3 and 4. Now, this is known as the promise of grace to take away the sins of the world. Now, later in Genesis 28, verse 14, this promise was transferred to Jacob. It says, In thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Exactly the same promise. And also we find God's promise, God promising Jacob that, that's in Genesis 35, verse 11, that kings shall come out of thy loins. Kings, brethren, in plural. But obviously, it seems not kings of one dynasty, of one line, but obviously kings of various dynasties. So therefore, we should not be surprised if all the European uh, royal families, because you might know that several European countries are uh, actually monarchies, like Norway, like Denmark, uh, the Netherlands, Spain, and there are other few others, I think, I'm not sure about Liechtenstein, and I'm not sure about Luxembourg, but I think they've got some royalties, uh, San Monaco as well. So we should not be surprised that those, those families uh, may trace back their origin to Jacob and of course the house of Israel. You after all you know that northern, northwestern part of Europe, northwestern European nations are all descendants of Israel. We'll just go over that as we go along. Of course, not to mention the British monarchy. We know that the British monarchy certainly is descendant of Jacob, and we certainly know that they are descendants of King David, direct descendants of King David. In the short lessons, we have those 12 lessons uh, about the house of Israel. We explain, explain that in a good detail, and I hope that I was very clearly uh, expounding that, those things to you, trying to get across, brethren, how important those information are. And that all the information that we, we are learning and that we are discovering is actually a proof that the word that we have, the Bible that we have, is indeed divinely inspired. Divinely inspired and all of the books in the Bible, we contain, you know, contain so much interesting information and knowledge, which is enough for us, you know. We don't need to be looking too much for extra biblical things, especially not... We should not be reaching into Gnostic teachings today like the book of Enoch and other Gnostic writings that have nothing to do with the Bible. The Bible itself contains all that we need to know. And it is very rich. It is very rich and it's very revealing. And it just, you know, the truth, as we get to know it, the truth simply sets us free. Now, again, so uh, we have the promise that Jacob will have kings shall come out of his loins. And this promise was later, by the way, this promise about the kings, brethren, was later transferred to Judah by Jacob. Because Jacob, at his deathbed in Genesis 49 and verse 10, prophesied that the scepter, which is the ruling staff, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet. Now, margin says a lawgiver. Margin says ruler's staff. So the scepter nor ruler's staff 
shall not be shall not depart from Judah, you know, from between his feet. And then in First Chronicles chapter five verse two, it says that Judah prevailed above his brethren, and of him came the chief ruler. Now this in First Chronicles five chapter uh, chapter five verse two, of course, does refer both to David in type and to Christ. From him came chief ruler. David was the chief ruler of all the house of Israel. And Jesus Christ, of course, as he comes, he'll be the chief ruler of all the house of Israel and of all the world. But don't forget, as it says in Romans 11, all the nations will be grafted into Israel, brethren. So therefore, <laughs> all the world will become Israel. All the world will become God's people. Now, Christ is also the fulfillment of the promised seed that causes all the nations of the earth to be blessed by grace and salvation. So it is not surprising that we read that salvation in John chapter 4 verse 22, that salvation is of the Jews. And also in Romans 1 16, to the Jew first. Now Christ, contrary to some ludicrous statements that he wasn't a Jew, uh, that popped up, I think, recently, in the recent perhaps five to seven years. I've seen some absolutely incredible claims about him not being Jews, even in Serbian language. <laughs> They claim, of course, that he was Serbian. Could you believe that? But anyway, Christ was a Jew. Hebrews 7, verse 14, the Apostle Paul tells us that he was a Jew. And also in John chapter 4, verse 9, we see that Samaritan woman, you know, at the well, was completely shocked that he, being a Jew, was talking to her, being a Samaritan. So Judah gave from Judah came, and, you know, salvation is of the Jews, not only for the Jews, but of the Jews, and to the Jew first. And Judah, if you see in Numbers chapter 10, verse 14, went first on marches. Went first on marches when Israel would be moving. And Judah's lot of inheritance was given first. It's written in Joshua chapter 15, verse 1. Now Judah also, brethren, had two more sons by his daughter-in-law Tamar. You might remember the story from Genesis chapter 38. Those two sons were called Phares and Zerah. Now they were racially pure Caucasians. And both could claim to be the firstborn, and consequently both established royal lines, as we did mention in those 12 short lessons. Now the proof that they were sons of Judah, and therefore royalty, lay in the signet, or ring, and also in bracelets and staff of Judah that he gave to Tamar as a pledge. Genesis 38 verse 18, she asked him you know, to give him those things as a pledge. Interestingly enough, you'll find bracelets in 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 10 as well. So we have signet, ring, bracelets, and staff. Now, brethren, thus, the British Royal Coronation Service, which uses these three items plus the scepter in the ceremony, testifies continually to the accuracy and truth of God's promise. Perhaps you didn't know that, you know, the British Royal Coronation Service did include all those items, but it does. Now, that was, that was as far as the Faris is concerned, because we know that the British thro uh, throne is uh, now currently occupied by the descendants of Faris. And you know that as well, because out there, if you type out in Google out the genealogy of Queen Elizabeth, you'll find exactly that information. Her genealogy goes back to Faris, then it goes back to, uh, it goes back to, uh, well, back to King David, back to Faris, back to Judah, back all the way down to Adam. And I'm sure that the British royal family is aware of that. However, I don't know why it is not being widely publicized, perhaps, perhaps because we're living in, in a highly secular world which despises the Bible and the Bible knowledge. But of all the people on the face of the earth, we should be aware of these things. This is part of the key of David. And, you know, at times, I have to tell you, I, I do wish that I would have five minutes just to speak to Prince William or uh, Prince Harry about their origin, just to remind them and just to tell them that there, there is a group of people out there who are well aware of who they are. Now, Zara, the second son of Judah and Tamara, his daughter-in-law, Zara had no children, brethren, when he went down into Egypt with his grandfather Jacob. In Genesis chapter 46, verse 12, you'll find who came to Egypt. So Zara had no children, but his twin brother Phares was accompanied by his two sons, which are recorded in the same chapter, verse 26. Son one is called Hezron, H-E, 
Z or Z R O N and Hamul H A M U L. So Faris had two sons and Zara had no sons. Now the descendants of Zara, both sons and grandsons, are mentioned in First Chronicles chapter two, verse six, seven, and eight, and in First Kings chapter four, verses thirty and thirty-one. They're mentioned as the Ezrahite, basically meaning in effect Zerahite and Heman, and Chalcol, or Chalcol, and Darda, the sons of Mahol. It's in 1 Kings chapter 4, and this is verse 31. But brethren, but the biblical genealogy of Zara, this is very important to understand, the biblical genealogy of Zara ends with this third generation, indicating the departure of Zara's line from Israel, while Israel was in Egypt, 400 for 400 years genesis chapter 15 verse 13 will tell you that though they departed even before the exodus of israel where did they go where did they go well the history tells us that calcol calcol established zaragasa zaragasa meaning the stronghold of zara which is now called saragossa in the ebro valley in spain Ebro Valley, obviously now named after Eber, the father of the Hebrews, brethren. And Saragossa is a famous, today it's a famous Spanish town. Now, in Historia Britannica, written by Camden, it states that Calcol sailed from Egypt to Spain and from Spain to Ireland, where he established Ulat, or as we know it, Ulster or as we know it, Northern Ireland today. Now, the Irish Lebhar Gadhala, or Book of Conquests, points to these Iberi, or Iberians, from the Iberian Peninsula, from Spain, <coughs> also called Firbolgs, as being the earliest inhabitants of Ireland. They called the land Iberne, which was later abbreviated to Erne, then Erin, and then later Latinized to Hibernia. Those are all the names for Ireland, brethren. And even today, I think, in poetic, poetically, it is still called Erin. Now realize that in pre-Exodus days, Abraham's descendants were still called Hebrews. You can find that reference in Exodus chapter 2, verse 16, and verse 13, etc. They were also called Heberites, Heberites in Numbers chapter 26, verse 45. Now, thus, brethren, the Hibernians, Hi Hi those who came from Hibernia, Hibernians or Iberi, who came to Ireland about 1700 before Christ from the Ebro River in Iberia, must be Hebrews. They must be Hebrews. They also gave their name to the Hebrides Islands, and also to Eboracum, later called York, the English town of York. Now, other cities in Wales and Scotland also are prefixed by the letters Aber. John Dunham Massey, one of the British writers, he states that there is evidence also that Hebrew was spoken almost all over Ireland at a very early period as ancient inscriptions in that language have been unearthed not only on the coast but even in the very center of the country. Now Ulster or Northern Ireland has even to this day the heraldic symbol of a red hand circled by a scarlet cord which of course harks back to the incident in Genesis chapter 38 verse 28 where Zara put his hand out of the womb and the midwife took and bound upon his hand a scarlet thread saying this came out first but then you remember he just pulled his hand back and his brother Faris came out it's very easy to prove brethren all that you need to do is just google out <coughs> the flag of Ulster or Northern Ireland and you'll see as I said heraldic symbol of red hand circled by a scarlet cord now, in both Ulster and Scotland, these are the ancient and traditional official arms and heraldry. 
Kalkol may have also been the Egyptian Kekrops. There is a theory about that. Kekrops or Niul, N-I-U-L, who founded Athens and Thebes at the same time when Troy was founded. Now, a rampant red lion is also found on the arms of many families of Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales today, brethren. And this is because Judah was likened to a lion. In Genesis 49 verse 9, his father Jacob called him a lion. And also Zara Judah would link the color, color red to the lion because of the scarlet thread. So the Scotch, Welsh, and Irish, in that order, have varying degrees of Iberian or Zara blood. You'll find that in the, the writings History of England, written by George Macaulay Trevelyan, pages 32 and 30, 33. Now, Calcol's brother Darda, King James Version margin of 1 Chronicles 2, verse 6, called Dardanus, by Josephus. So Darda or Dardanus was the Egyptian founder of Troy and he was also the kingdom founder of, and, uh, of the kingdom of Priam on the southern shore of the strait called Dardanelles. Now of course Dardanelles we see again the tribe of Dan and the uh, way mark of the house of Israel on its way of migration from their new land where they were taken by the Assyrians they were taken around the Black Sea and then they just moved made their move to Northwest Europe so anyway the kingdom of you see Priam and the Troy was founded by Dardanus or Darda now hundreds of years later the city Troy was overthrown in the famous siege of Troy there is a uh, perhaps a little bit romanticized, uh, we might say, that movie about Troy. But nevertheless, it's very educational and uh, it's very impressive as far as I'm concerned. So what happened after the siege of Tro Troy, brethren? Uh, after it was overturned, after which Aeneas, the last of the royal blood, took what was left of his nation and traveled with them into Europe. Now his son Brutus, on going to Malta, he was there advised to re-establish his people in the Great White Island. Now, Britain was called, brethren, Great White Island because of the White Cliffs of Dover. And this advice was recorded in the archaic Greek on the Temple of Diana in Caia Troia, New Troy, and was later verified by the Pope. Now, the king, Brutus, landed at Torbay. That was how it was called at that time, Torbay. An historic stone still stands in the town of Totnes in England. Commemorating his coming, he built himself a new capital city to which he also gave the name Caer Troia or New Troy. The Romans later called it Londinium, now known as London. And again, even in Londinium, you see in London, we have again the waymark. We have the uh, trace of the tribe of Dan, because the tribe of Dan was like a serpent's trail. We just left all the way, all the signs on the way where the house of Israel would migrate. So there we are. Now Heman, H-E-M-A-N, brother of Neul, may have been the contemporary Egyptian Agenon, who inherited Phoenicia. Machol, M-A-H-O-L, son of Zara and the father of these famous Egyptians was Scytha S-C-Y-T-H-A or Phoenicia Farsa the Egyptian ancestor of the Milesians you'll find it in another of the books which I have uh, as, a, as a reference which is Charles Adil Lewis Totten's Our Race series volume 4 page 165 and also you can see Troy and Green Greek and Milesian sources, brethren, on the subject. Now, the Chronicles of Ireland, they mentioned that the branch of Judah known as Zara colonized all the shores of the Mediterranean Sea and as far west as the British Isles and Ireland. And no wonder, as I told you, as 
part of the house of Israel, obviously the house of part of the house of Judah as well, Zara's branch, they just sailed around and left the traces where they went. Others who traveled over the land, they also left the traces on the land. Perhaps the most uh, outstanding one is the river Danube. River Danube, which goes, basically leads us all the way up to Denmark. Now, Jacob prophesied in, uh, in Genesis chapter 49. Jacob prophesied for Judah. He says, Judah... Thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thy enemies. Now, brethren, your brethren, it says uh, thy brethren shall praise. It doesn't say they will persecute the Jewish people in ghettos, pogroms, or concentration camps. Now, thankfully, when you, when you take a look at the Northwest Europe, it wasn't the instrumental in persecuting of the Jews. The instruments of the persecution of the Jews were the Germans the modern descendants of Assyrians. However, we have to say that the uh, some parts of Northwest Europe did, however, collaborate with Germans, in particular France, the Netherlands, to a certain degree. There was one nation that was exception, a great exception was Denmark. Danish king, as far as I learned, put even the David, so-called David star around his, banded it around his arm in solidarity with his Jewish subjects. But nevertheless, the uh, German Nazis in Denmark, I think they have, they did commit some, in some way, the Holocaust as well, not as much as they did elsewhere. But again, you know, the primary author of the Holocaust were, were not Israelites, but were non-Israelites, Germans in particular. Now it says, uh, he, thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Well, that happened when we via, via King David in type. You can see that in 2 Samuel chapter 22, verse 41. In his Psalm 18, verse 40, he basically, you know, was on the neck of his enemies and there was a peace around his kingdom. Then the prophecy of Jacob about Judah continues, thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp from the prey, my son. They are gone up. He stooped down. He crouched as a lion. Who shall rouse him up? In other words, like a lion. You may know that lion is also a symbol of Jerusalem, brethren. Now, which what means that, you know, Judah is peace-loving, but it's formidable when attacked. And I think their neighbors know that very well. The scepter, continues Jacob, shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver, margin ruler's staff, from between his feet, until Shiloh come. Well, brethren, this, that Judah, that the scepter shall not depart, and, and, and ruler's staff from between his feet, that happened tribally, was fulfilled in Numbers chapter 10, verse 14, also in Judges chapter 1, verses 2 and 10, and in the 15th chapter of Joshua. Now, personally, it was also fulfilled in the kingly line. Once ten generations have elapsed from Judah, Tamara, so from Genesis 38 until Deuteronomy 23 and verse 2, that also happened, you see, tribally. And then it says, until Shiloh come, or tribally, till he comes to Shiloh, the religious capital city, which is described in Joshua chapter 18, verse 1, in type, and personally in David and the millennial promised land in final fulfillment. So Shiloh is going to come, as it says, Shiloh, Shiloh, among the Jewish people, is the term for Messiah. And unto him, unto Judah, shall the gathering of the people be, binding his foal unto the wine, and his ass is called unto the choice wine. He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be red with wine and his teeth white with milk. Meaning plenty of wine and plenty of milk. Now brethren, yeah, this is what I've just read. The uh, prophecy of his father Jacob is Genesis chapter 49 verses 8 through 12. Now interestingly enough, the name Judah, as you see itself, actually means praise doesn't mean defamation, it means praise. Why? Well, because in Genesis 29, verse 35, 
Judah's mother, conceived again and bore a son, and she said, Now will I praise the Eternal. Therefore she called his name Judah and left bearing. Now, interestingly enough, that the Ulster men, Northern Irishmen, brethren, when exported, they, you know, Northern Irishmen, Ulster, Ulster men becomes an explosive commodity. Here is one remarkable fact that perhaps you people in the United States are not aware of. Of the 36 presidents of the United States, nearly one-third came of Ulster stock, and this from a country with a population smaller than the borough of Brooklyn. Presidents of known Ulster ancestry were Andrew Jackson, James Polk, James Buchanan, Andrew Johnson, Ulysses Grant, Chester Arthur, Grover Cleveland, Benjamin Harrison, William McKinley, and Woodrow Wilson perhaps the most known at least to us here in Europe and very well known to us in Serbia he was a big friend of the Serbian nation and therefore in the new part of Belgrade Belgrade waterfront uh, a new avenue which is being built will be named after Woodrow Wilson and uh, a monument is also planned to be erected in his honor he was a great great friend of Serbia and uh, at the end of the second of the first world war that is I think he was uh, he was instrumental of uh, forming of the modern Serbia within its borders because he was he realized that the Austro-Hungarian Empire was the losing side and the uh, small Serbia was on the winning side. And that history repeated itself rather than later in the Second World War when the Austrians and Germans attacked a little Serbia, dismembered it, occupied it and uh, committed another genocide. In any case, I've just named you several presidents of known Ulster ancestry, Brandon, but there are other famous Americans of Ulster ancestry. Do you know that Davy Crockett was the one? Then Stonewall Jackson, Horace Greenlee, Stephen Foster, for example, and a whole parcel of invest inventors, including Cyrus and Robert McCormick, Robert Fulton, and Samuel Morse. Morse is, uh, Morse is uh, how do you call it in English? Moses alphabet or Moses, uh, Moses the way to communicate. In any way, you'll find this interesting information in National Geographic, August 1964, page 261. So, brethren, these men, all these men we are mentioning, have been praised. You know, their their hands have been in the necks of their enemies by means of their authority, wealth, and power. Now, other people have bowed down before them because they are leaders and rulers. One of those was, for example, would you know, was President George Bush. George Bush will be the most regular president ever. Was uh, uh, it's a quote from a Seattle Times in 1988. He says London's ge genealogical specialist Berkus Pirage say the Bush roots, which come directly from Henry III, are a great advantage. In the past, the candidate with the most royal blood has usually won said Harold Brooks, Bar Baker Burke's publishing director. The research found that Princess Diana is a 13th cousin four times removed of Bush and Queen Elizabeth is a 13th, 13th cousin twice removed. Well, apparently that was uh, written in 1988 in Seattle Times. Now, you know, the kings of Scotland, England and most of Europe all come from these Ulster Scotch lines also. Now let us turn, brethren, to the Promised Land where the forest branch is still located. It says in Genesis 49 verse 10, it gives the scepter ruler staff blessing to Zara and Fares. However, later in 2 Samuel chapter 7 verse 16, this scepter was given forever to the forest line of David's house through Hezron. Hezron, who is mentioned in 1 Chronicles chapter 4 verse 1, not humble, H-A-M-U-L, who is mentioned in 1 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 5. So to the farthest line of David's house through Hezron was given the scepter forever, and Jesus Christ was of this farthest scepter kingly line. Remember in Luke chapter 1, verse 32, it says, Gabriel said to his mother that he will come to inherit the throne of his father. When he came the first time, he didn't inherit the throne of his father, so when he comes the second time, he's going to do that, brethren. 
and he was also a Jew, as we read in John 4, 4 verse 9, in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 14. Then David's throne is unconditionally, brethren, established forever. We already went over those scriptures. Let me remind you, 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 4, Jeremiah chapter 33, verses 17 through 26, Psalm 89, verses 3 and 4, and then verses 28 through 37. All those scriptures establish David's throne unconditionally forever, which means, brethren, it must exist today. Because Christ cannot come back to a non-existent throne. And even if the United Kingdom is invaded and taken captive, which it will be, as we know from the prophecy, the throne will continue somehow will continue. I don't know. We can speculate. I'm just, it's not a doctrine, but we said we can speculate. The throne has to continue because the one who needs to occupy has to come and take it over, brethren, not establish at his second coming. It doesn't say, it wasn't said to his mother Mary, when, your, when, he'll, bore us, that, when he'll give birth to a son, that that son will come back the second time, establish the throne and sit upon the throne. No, it says that he will come and sit on the already existing throne. So the throne has to exist. Now, my, my speculation was one of my speculation for those who may need to have it on record. My, one of my speculation was perhaps, who knows, what if they make it to Jordan? Jordan is also a monarchy, by the way. What if they make it to Jordan? What if they make it to the place of safety, brethren? Remember, Jordan will be spared three, three, three years. Obviously, for a certain reason. To help the Philadelphia remnant in the place of safety. So what if the royal family, whoever will be ruling the, you know, the house on the house of, or part of the royal family, with a, uh, a with a uh, successor, Prince William, for example, what if they come to the place of safety? Uh, we don't know. It's just a speculation, not a doctrine. My other speculation was, I I keep reminding you that Queen Elizabeth is also the third cousin of the Russian Tsar. Russian Tsar Nikolai, who was murdered by the Bolsheviks, who was murdered by the communists. And therefore, since Russia will be safe haven, because Russia will be later attacked by the Germans, there will be a counterattack to sweep all the Germans. You know, who knows? Perhaps the British royal family, being in relation with the Russian royal family, may find refuge in Moscow, in Russia. I don't know. I'm just speculating, but the fact is, this is the fact, and not a speculation, that even if the United Kingdom is invaded and taken captive, the throne will continue somehow. That's guaranteed. And there is no reason to doubt that. And there is no reason to have human reasoning, well, the nation will be taken captive, the nation will no longer exist, that therefore the throne will be non-existent. Well, then the prophecy would fail, brethren. Remember what we, what we read about the prophecy about the throne of David? It will be overturned three times and no more. Three times it will be overturned, which means that when the, king, the United Kingdom is invaded and taken captive, the throne will not be overturned. It will continue somehow, somewhere. But you see, Zara, the second son of Judah, and Tamara, Zara was not excluded from the rulership blessing. In fact, you know, the last Davidic king mentioned in succession was Zedekiah of Judah, who was dethroned in, 50, uh, in uh, 585 before Christ. In Jeremiah 39.6, it says also the king of Babylon slew the sons of Zedekiah. In Jeremiah 52 verse 11, we also read that Zedekiah was put in prison till the day of his death. Now, King Jeconiah was excluded from the throne of David also in Jeremiah 22 verse 24 through 30. We went through all of those verses. I'm just reminding you. Now Judah was now beginning in 585 before Christ, her seven times of national punishment and Jeremiah was commanded to, in Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 10, to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down. And you know, what was that referring to? It was referring to the royalty of the farthest line in Judah. But after this, it says Jeremiah 40 verse 6, went Jeremiah to Mizpah. Why, why to Mizpah? Because King Zedekiah's daughters were in Mizpah. 
Jeremiah 41 verse 10. And incidentally, the book of Esther, brethren, indicates that the Jews looked like Persians and were not of any special appearance. In Esther chapter 2 verse 10, that's how it, where it is written. You can also find reference in 1 Samuel chapter 16 verse 12. So apparently Nebuchadnezzar did not know that Hebrew law permitted the princess to inherit the throne where there was no male descendants. If you go to Numbers 27 verse 8, you'll find this law that was established in Israel. So Nebuchadnezzar did not harm Zedekiah's daughters. He didn't take them to Babylon either. Now, Jeremiah 43, verse 5 to 7, the king's daughters and Jeremiah the prophet and Baruch came into the land of Egypt. And from Flinders Petrius' excavation in Egypt of the very house where Jeremiah, the princess, and the little company lived, there is a house which has retained to our time the name of the house of the Jews' daughter. So when they arrived in toughness, which was the Egyptian city, the Eternal warned Jeremiah that Babylon's king would soon overrun Egypt and also and destroy the remnant of Judah there. So Jeremiah returned into the land of Judah, Jeremiah 44, verse 28. And he was commissioned, as you see, in the first chapter of his book, as he, he recorded, he was commissioned to build and to plant. Now, you know, Jeremiah 1.10, as the prophecy said, the remnant... Prophecy in Isaiah 37, verse 31 and 32. The remnant that is escaped of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem shall go forth a remnant, and they that escape out of Mount Zion. Now this remnant, brethren, was the royal daughters, which you can also see in 2 Kings 19, verse 30 and 31. And in Ezekiel 21 and verse 25, we read that the royalty would change. Why? Well, because the Eternal says, Take off the crown. This crown shall not be the same. Exalt him that is low and abase him that is high. So Judah's son Phares was abased and Zara was exalted. The nation of Judah, brethren, also had been high and Israel low, as recorded in Hosea chapter 3, verse 4. So now the positions were reversed. The daughters were planted. As it says in Ezekiel chapter 17, verse 24, planted in the mountain of the height of Israel. And just as prophecy said, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 10, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them. So not only the tribes, brethren, that he will plant not only the tribes in, you know, in Israel, not in Judah anymore, but in Israel, but also the royalty. And in the parable of Ezekiel 17, if you read that one, it is encoded so no Babylonian spy could understand. That parable describes, there are several elements, describes this whole episode. Nebuchadnezzar and Pharaoh were the two eagles. There was the high cedar, which is the royal house of David. The highest branch was the king Zedekiah. The tender one, or the young twigs, was the young crown princess. Now the Hebrew word there, brethren, used for tender is feminine, in contrast to the masculine form of the same word in Isaiah 53 verse 2. So to a high mountain, which was Israel, as it says in verse 23, the how mount, the, to, to a high mountain that branch was taken, meaning in Ireland. And after the transplanting, this feminine twig, would bring forth boughs and bear fruit and be a godly cedar, which means brethren, that many royal descendants would come from it. And indeed, it says also under it shall dwell the fowl of every wing, meaning such nations as India, South Africa, Thailand, Malaysia, and Australia. And there are also mentioned trees of the field, which are kings, people of the world. So that was what was mentioned in Ezekiel chapter 17. And you can basically... From that reconstruct how the princess continued the dynasty of David, no longer in the promised land, but now in the land of Israel, in Ireland. The throne was overturned the second time. First time it was from Jerusalem to Ireland, second time from Ireland to Scotland, third and the last time from Scotland to England, brethren, and it will not be overturned again. That's what the prophecy says. We have no reason to doubt it. Now, the ancient chronicles of Ireland inform us that a say, 
Seiji, a wise man named Olam Fodla, meaning wonderful prophet, came from Egypt by way of Spain about six centuries before the Christian era, and that he landed on the northeast coast of Ireland, where Carrick Fergus is now. He brought with him a princess called Tamar Tefi, meaning the tender or palm beautiful, and a secretary scribe named Simon Brook or Brook. Irish poetry, brethren, and folklore identify Olaf Fodla as Jeremiah and Tamar Tefi as the daughter of Zedekiah. Ancient Irish poetry is full of praise for Tamar Tefi and tells of her lofty birth, her stormy life in Jerusalem, and her toughness in Egypt, her voyage to Spain, and from there to Ireland. Now, of course, on their voyage to Spain, you can guess where they stopped to make a break. As far as I remember, and I'll probably deliver you a bit more messages about those details, they stopped, I think, at Saragossa, <laughs> the stronghold of Zara, interesting enough. I think it's a port city today in Spain. And it is also claimed that Tamartef, his younger sister, Scotta, who was with Jeremiah on the first lap of the journey, never reached Ireland due to the fact that in Spain she married a Celtoscythian prince named Milesius. And Tamar Tefi married the Irish king called Elchide Hermon of the Zara branch of Judah. And so, you know, the two lines basically became united, the line of Fares and the line of Zara. They came on a ship belonging to the Iberian Danaan and brought with them a rough stone, a banner and a large mysterious chest. On the four courts at Dublin, which is the Supreme Court of Ireland, there is a statue of the prophet Jeremiah. I think it's a small statue. And it might be inside, but anyway, there is a statue of the prophet Jeremiah. But I mean, it doesn't make sense if Jeremiah didn't reach Ireland. And it is amazing how the you know Irish people have, I think, have completely forgotten, completely have lost the awareness of this fact. And to this very day, you can Google it out, to this very day, Jeremiah's burial place is pointed out on a Devonish island in Ireland. You can just Google it out. And it has been known through the centuries as Jeremiah's tomb. So what's wrong with people who are just, you know, who have been losing this precious knowledge, brethren? We have to be fired up for this truth. Lest we just get grow lukewarm and think that this is, this is all not really important. Yes, it is important because this all proves that the book we hold as the greatest, highest authority in our life is is book which is true. The veracity of the Bible is being proven by this historical facts as well it's reliable now from the union of Herimon and Teatefi came a long line of Irish monarchs you can all find them on you know if you just google out again you'll find all that list there which extended over a period of more than 1000 years the Scottish or Scotch monarchs were descendant from the Irish kings as I said and the last Scottish king James VI of Scotland became James I of England, and from him the present Queen of Great Britain descended, brethren. And of course, all of her other descendants. Now, Erin, or Erin, or Ireland. Erin, Erin, that was the poetic uh, expression for Ireland. Now, King Hermon and Queen Tamar Tefi were crowned at Tara, Tara Hill, Hebrew Torah, upon the Ida file or the coronation stone of Israel, just as the kings of Judah had been for centuries, brethren. It was at this time that the harp of David became part of the royal heraldic symbolism, since David was the farthest line. What is the symbol today of Ireland? It's a harp, brethren. Now, why would they get harp? So, you see, the heraldry also testifies about the history and identity of the modern house of Israel. Now the old prophet gave the law on Tara Hill too, and this stone of scone or Leah file, fatal stone or stone of destiny, has a fascinating history. It was Jacob's pillow 
for his head when he slept. Genesis 20, 28 verse 18 and then all the way up through verse 22 Jacob set it up you know for a pillar and entered into a tithing agreement with God brethren and we shall stop here and we'll continue later to see how Jacob entered into an agreement with Laban and took the same stone and set it up for a pillar and we'll just finish next time we shall finish this study about the tribe of judah a fascinating very fascinating tribe uh, a tribe with a very rich history and perhaps some of these things you might not have no you perhaps didn't know until this time but it's time we are living in the last days and all this precious knowledge needs to be restored and uh, it is being revealed to us by the grace of god